Okay, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the July session of the ALMA Q&A series. My name is Ali Verbovetskaya, and I am the Web and Mobile Systems Librarian in the Office of Library Services. Joining me today are Kevin Collins, uh, Systems Librarian in charge of ALIF, Roland Simiski, Systems Librarian in charge of our Link Resolver, SFX, as well as Easy Proxy, uh, Nancy Egan, Head of Budget and Collections, Kathy Wang, Head of Resource Description and Metadata Services, and Greg Goslin, Interim University Dean of Libraries and Information Systems. Today, we'll be introducing the ALMA Collaborative Network, which is a network of ALMA institutions connected together to facilitate collaboration and sharing of data and workflows. To understand yeah, I'm on, on here. I'm listening here. what that means, here, but we'll be watching a training video provided by the vendor, Ex Libris, that explains the various zones in ALMA. Afterwards, we'll be providing some CUNY-specific information about the zones, reviewing some ALMA-specific vocabulary, sharing some resources, and then we'll take any questions you have, be they about ALMA itself, its implementation at CUNY, the ALIF cleanup and optimization projects, or anything else that you would like to learn about. We're all here to answer your questions and assist you however we can. Uh, before we get started, I just want to handle some housekeeping. As usual, please do not place us on hold or take any other calls while you're on this call. Both of these things will cause your hold music to play, which is uh, incredibly disruptive for everyone on the call. And um, please also mute yourself until you are ready to ask a question. This is especially relevant if you're having a conversation in your office with a colleague or in the conference room, if you're eating breakfast or drinking a beverage. <laughs> um, this will just help to keep things running smoothly and avoid further disruption. Questions can be taken on the call or via the chat box in Zoom. I'll be monitoring that. Um, the session is being recorded and will be made available next week. Um, with that said, let's get started. First, we're going to be watching a nine minute video from Ex Libris to introduce us to the ALMA Collaborative Network. And just a note that in the following video, think of Collaborative Network as consortium and institution as campus. I think that will help you sort of place things in context. Okay, and so let's get started. Welcome to this introductory session on ALMA Collaborative Networks. In this session, we'll start by looking at the structure of a collaborative network in ALMA, which is sometimes called a consortium, and how the network zone works. Next, we'll examine the functions and capabilities of the network zone. Then we'll discuss some key issues in resource sharing in a collaborative network. Finally, after a session review, there will be a short quiz to test your knowledge. All institutions that use ALMA are made up of several levels in an organizational hierarchy. Each institution has their own ALMA instance provided by Ex Libris. Institutions contain libraries, each of which has locations that provide items for fulfillment and so on. Will create uh, uh, Only member institutions in your collaborative network will have access to this network institution. Institutions will be able to easily share resources with each other, and the network institution can be a central place to share a catalog, publish centrally to a discovery service, collaborate on acquisition, and much more. While all member institutions will have access to content in the network institution, only a few staff members in your collaborative network will be able to log into the network institution as though it was an institution itself. Other staff at member institutions will access the network institution through the network zone. So let's talk about the zones. You are probably familiar with your institution zone, that is, the bibliographic records, holding records, and item records of your institution's inventory and subscriptions. You may also be familiar with the community zone, which is the ALMA knowledge base from which you can get bibliographic data, mostly for electronic resources, shared by both Ex Libris and other ALMA institutions throughout the world. In ALMA collaborative networks, there is a third zone, the network zone. 
This is the manifestation of your network institution, where member institutions of an Alma collaborative network can share the management of metadata records and acquisitions and can choose to share other Alma services, such as fulfillment, resource sharing, vendor information, and administration tables. When searching for resources in Alma, you can choose whether your search will look in your own institution zone, your collaborative network zone, or the Alma community zone. Now, let's examine the functions and capabilities of a network zone. In the same way that you can link bibliographic records in your institution zone with those in the community zone, institution zone bibliographic records that are linked to bibliographic records managed in the network zone are automatically updated with any modifications that take place in the network zone. The network zone also can provide centralized publishing. The network institution can publish into Primo the following types of bibliographic records for the member institutions. All records that are managed by the network only. All records to which one or more members are linked. The network records are enriched with local data from members, such as course information, local fields, availability, electronic availability, and so on. Each member's local bibliographic records. The ability to run the job from the network zone institution helps prevent duplication of records that may occur in Primo if each institution in the network were to run publishing separately. You can also configure open URL link resolving to include electronic services for electronic resources managed in the network zone. When enabled, any open URL request to the Alma link resolver checks the network zone to resolve electronic services that are available for the institution. The electronic services are presented in the View It tab of the Alma Link Resolver's services page. Member institutions of a network can collaborate on acquisitions by purchasing and negotiating e-resources jointly, such as packages, databases, and individual titles. These collaborative networks usually have some organization supporting the joint acquisitions activities, such as a consortial buying office or a cataloging network office, and so on. You can also use an institution-level patron-driven acquisitions program in the context of the network zone. Candidate bibliographic records can be imported from the institution zones and uploaded or linked to the network zone bibliographic records. In a collaborative environment, electronic resources can be managed centrally in the network zone. In some cases, there are requirements to limit access to electronic resources to a certain group of member institutions within the collaborative network. That is, the electronic resources in the network zone are not available to all the patrons across the entire collaborative network, or specific coverages are assigned to different institutions. In order to address this requirement and manage which members in the network zone have access to the electronic resources, Alma provides the available for functionality. That is, configurable inventory management groups. The purpose of inventory management groups is to provide the capability of limiting access to identified electronic resources. Network zones have many capabilities. For Alma administrators, institutions can share Alma configuration tables, letters, and perhaps most importantly, user information. In acquisitions, institutions can share licenses for e-resources, vendor data, and provide visibility to purchase order lines. In resource management, cataloging staff can share bib records and authority records, external search configurations, and import profiles. Fulfillment information can be shared, and institutions can enrich resource sharing rota. When analytics are needed, institutions can view consolidated information. And patrons trying to discover resources are especially helped with a collaborative network because they can be presented with combined inventory. Display logic rules can be defined throughout the network, you can publish to Primo much more easily and with fewer duplication errors, and you can manage open URL resolving. Next, we'll discuss some key issues in resource sharing in a collaborative network. In a broad sense, resource sharing is just a way for institutions to allow their patrons to have access to resources outside the patron's home institution. Alma helps institutions maximize cooperation and save costs. Instead of purchasing resources every time a patron wants something the institution currently does not have, an institution can find another source that is less expensive. And Alma encourages this sharing because Alma's tools speed up workflow and reduce staff effort. 
network sharing does not require that institutions belong to a collaborative network with a network zone. But it does require some things to be worked out in advance, and here are a few of the key ones. Institutions have to agree how they will share materials and supply services. They will need to establish service levels and agree on lending policies. The institutions need to create a group responsible for recommending those shared policies and best practices. And there needs to be a process for institutions to suggest changes to those shared policies. There's much more information about resource sharing in the next training session in this series. That concludes the main portion of this training session. Let's briefly review what was covered. Well, no, he did that. Okay. So that was the video where there's no need for us to take the quiz <laughs> that is in that video. Um, so let's talk uh, about Kevin, it is very loud where you are. Okay. So the, with the, let's talk about the zones. The, the, the zones are actually three separate areas. There's, you know, of course, the community zone. Think of electronic resources that exist worldwide. There are the network zone. Think of CUNY wide. Network zone. Not everything that's in the community zone is in the network zone. For example, you might publish, somebody might be publishing OER or, or thesis or other things into academic works. It may be something that your library subscribes to, but is not available in the community zone. You could still add it to the network zone if it's for everyone across CUNY, or you could put it in your institution zone if it's just for your, just for your own library. So, so in Aleph term, uh, in terms, you would be thinking of community-wide would be network zone, and then your own own code would be your institution zone. I, I think that's pretty clear to, to most people at this point. Okay, thank you. And then we wanted to mention some terminology that is almost specific and that we thought might be new to some of the folks at CUNY. Um, in ALMA, the term fulfillment refers to any activity that fulfills a request, including circulation, pick lists, stacks maintenance, routing, resource sharing, course reserves, billing, and of course, patron services. In ALMA, the ful fulfillment contains the following workflows or sections, circulation desk operations, booking, including rooms, equipment, holds on books, Resource requests, in our case, that would be clicks. By that mode. Resource sharing and interlibrary loan and uh, reserves. And then there are also some advanced tools to configure fulfillment and these will be discussed in another webinar. So that's fulfillment in Alma. There's also something called inventory and Alma inventory provides you with the capability to manage uh, multiple types of resources, including electronic and physical. It also can uh, manage digital resources, but we're not licensing that functionality at CUNY. And Alma's inventory menu interface designed for non-catalogers enables staff to enter library information for holdings, items, activated electronic resources, and digital objects, but again, we don't have digital resources at CUNY. Um, we just wanted to follow up with some links to resources. So if you wanted to watch this video again that we just watched, it is this first link. Um, there's also a whole series of videos available under um, Alma Essentials. And in the orientation, I believe there are two videos that are about nine minutes each that are also worth watching. And then there's also a link to just all of the training, all the training available from Ex Libris. And again, so somebody, you, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, so if somebody really wanted to take the quiz, it actually okay. might be interesting to watch the video. Uh, again. You know, with these Ex Libris videos, uh, there's there's no there's no harm in watching them a, a second time or a third time on your own. Uh, and certainly, it's the opportunity to take the quiz. It, Kind of enlightening nobody knows how the results of how you did on the quiz but it's interesting to get that feedback to, to see if you're really understanding everything exactly because it'll explain if you if it doesn't agree with your answer it explains to you the reason why 
The correct answer is, is the correct answer. Uh, so um, we also link back to the ALMA implementation guide at CUNY. If you haven't taken a look at that, we definitely recommend you do that. It includes information about the project, a calendar of events, the um, organizational structure we've put in place with um, limited member working groups, as well as a steering committee and a communications committee. Um, their charges and the rosters are available there as well. And um, the Ex Libris Knowledge Center, of course, just has more documentation about ALMA if you are so inclined to review it. And now is the portion of the webinar, the, the Q&A portion. Um, so if you have any questions, please ask them now. You can do it on the call or via chat in Zoom. Are there any questions about the collaborative network structure in ALMA, about the video we just watched? Is there anything about the Aleph optimization projects that you're curious about? Okay, I have a question in chat from Alicia Selly at the Graduate Center. Just wondering if we will no longer be using the PCI, the Primo Central Index, when we begin to use the zones. And, um, no, and Roland, you can jump in too if you wish, but the Primo Central Index provides article level resources uh, access, whereas the Alma Community Zone provides title level access. So the Alma Community Zone, and Kevin, Kathy, feel free to jump in as well. Um, the Alma Community Zone provides title level access to e-journals and e-books so we will continue to use the PCI for the title level. So for the article, uh, sorry, the article level of resources that are currently discoverable through OneSearch. Right. It's it's useful to think of it as it's a stable constant. It's something that we have in Primo today, and it's something we will continue having in the future when we replace Aleph with Alma on the back end. Primo, pre, PCI, Primo Central Index is really front end and that part remains, you know, constant. And Roland, I think if you want to talk about this at all, um, the PCI itself will be changing a little bit. It will be, um, since the acquisition of Ex Libris by ProQuest, um, ProQuest had its, a separate index for Summon, its, its discovery service, and the two indexes have been or in the process of being combined, and we will soon have access to what is known as the CDI, I think the Central Discovery Index. Um, so it'll be like the PCI, but just have a different name. And Roland, if you want to talk more about that. Sure. I think uh, what you're referring to is what is called the CDI, the Central Discovery Index, which is the actual uh, merger of the Salmon Index and the PCI the Primo Central Index, and that is being developed or entering kind of a production phase right now. Um, a, a part of all Alma customers will be using the CDI starting in the first quarter of 2020, but uh, I don't know yet uh, at what point we will be using the CDI simply because we haven't met with Ex Libris staff to discuss this. Uh, but we will do so, and as soon as we have more information, um, we'll share that with everyone. The other big advantage of the CDI, the Central Discovery Index, is that you only have to activate things in one place, which is a big improvement because right now, if you want to activate a collection of um, resources that you license, you have to do so in two places. Uh, you have to do that in the PCI as well as the SFX knowledge base. With the combined index, you will only have to do that in one place. Did that answer the question? Yes, I think so. Thank you. Okay. And again, we'll be using whatever version of the PCI or CDI 
in the future. Right. Um, I have a question from Jesus Sanabria, I think, um, from Bronx Community College. Does the fulfillment function encompass any cataloging functions specifically for catalogers? That is not for non-catalogers. Fulfillment is circulation, plus it's also, you know, reserves, course reserves, includes ILL. So it's more broadly defined than one might think about access services. Although really, it's, it's really best to think of it as front of the house. Anything you do to fulfill the request by the patron is basically covered by fulfillment. So it's, it's direct interaction with the patron. It's, it's separate from, the, let's say, the back of the house, which would be the cataloging, the acquisitions, the, the, the management of serious materials in the catalog. So that the, there is, so it, it's something that, that's, it's new, but it's gonna become much more clear as we get into the training late in the fall. Okay, thank you, Kevin. I have another question from Jim Malone at Queens College. Does the non-cataloger ability refer to, ma to making a brief temporary item record for CERC change out, charge out, charge out, sorry then a more fully catalog record can be made later? I believe there will be that functionality. The, 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 the devil's in the details and the details are something we're gonna cover later on when we get into the, the training phase of, of, of it. Part of it also looks at the issue of who has permission to do what. And those are, those are things that have not yet been discussed by the, the working groups. And that's where those types of discussions and decisions would, would be made. But I believe the functionality is there. So, so that yes, I have a book, it's not in the catalog, but I need to check it out. I'm at the CERC desk, I have a way to get something in the, in the catalog so that we remember what the record is and who has it, who has the particular item, and the item can go ahead and circulate. And then yes, of course, later on the cataloger can create a more full, full and robust record for the material. Yeah, and I think we'll also have more information once we actually get a test uh, sandbox environment in place and we can actually experiment with the functionality. Hmm. Um, right, so, and just for that reason, we, we can't, fully answer every question. <laughs> um, and the question about fulfillment, does that include intra CUNY sharing? What, what we have now today in Aleph is we have clicks. Clicks is really a title request across the one entire institution. In Aleph, CUNY is set up as one giant institution. So mm -hmm. when you're putting in a clicks request, what you're actually doing in, in Aleph speak is you're putting, you're putting in a title request a request for any copy anywhere across CUNY. So that's certainly something we will replicate in ALMA. And yes, that would be fulfillment. And ILL will still be handled by the external systems that we have in place, correct? Correct. That will be separate. Yeah. Okay. Iliad, Iliad is not going away. Tapasa is not going away. There are plenty of Alma libraries who are using Iliad concurrently. They're very, they're happy and content. It's not, when I talk to users from other libraries, it's just not a concern. It, they may have concerns or questions about things, but ILL is not one of those concerns. Sure. Thank you. Um, another question from Jesus. Could you provide a more relatable definition for functions for the layman? And sorry, just which which word of which functions was was the problem, Jesus? If you can provide a little more context. Um, 
And while I wait for that context, there's a question from Ellen Sexton at uh, John Jay. Is the community circle CUNY or is the network circle CUNY? And the community zone would be all, all of the resources. So a vendor has 52 packages of, elect, of various electronic resources. Those sit in the community zone. In the network zone, I don't have, at my library, I don't have all 52. I may only have, say, 20 of those electronic packages. So I'm going to activate those 20. So now in the, and, and for some reason, I'm central office, so I'm activating for everybody across CUNY. So now in the network zone, we have 20 resources from that, or 20 packages from that vendor. So there's, so that the network zone is, includes a subset of what's in the community zone. Not everything in the community zone is in the network. It could be if somebody goes in and chooses to activate it and add it to our network, but it may not, it doesn't start out that way. And the network zone would be, of course, everything that is, you think of everything that's active in the catalog today, it may be for Postos, it may be for Hunter, maybe it's only for BMCC, that's okay. It's still in the network zone. It seems odd that community zone would be electronic, but it actually, that's all it is, is the electronic resources. It does not include physical print items. Physical print items that you add, will, you would add into your, you would add a bibliographic record into the network zone, and then in, you would attach your holdings into the institution zone. So in other words, your institution, you hold a copy, three other libraries will own a copy. Somebody who's searching across the network zone would be able to, it's, it's like a CUNY-wide search or it, in, in, that we do today. It would be just like that. You would be able to search. Oh, I see there's four different libraries that own this item. If I want to search only the institution, because I just want to see what's in my library. If you own a copy, you'll see it. Right. So just to recap, the network zone is the CUNY consortium, right? Those are the ones shared across and the institution zone are the local ones. So like you said, Kevin, earlier, the network zone is sort of the, what we're used to seeing as the all CUNY, the union network and the institution zone is the local owned by just the one institution. Kathy. Ali, yes, um, I um, I have this description of Alma Community Zone definition. It says it's a shared repository for all Alma users. It includes authority records, bibliographic metadata, and an electronic materials knowledge base. So it includes um, more than just e-resources. He has authority records and also bibliographic metadata for physical items, just to add to uh, Kevin's definition. Thank you. And um, follow up from Jim Malone is, so there is no copy cataloging of bib records for physical items from the community zone? The community zone only provides records for e-resources? Oh, that's not true. No, <laughs> actually, just, there's a question. Yep. Yeah. That's the design of the community zone. That's that's how it's it's geared. Physical items do creep into it, but there that's part of the debate about uh, in the in the larger community is what what belongs in the community zone, what doesn't belong in the community zone, and a number of people at Exlevers have committed to the idea that Community zone is intended to be elect electronic, but the the reality is that these these things are never pure. Right. And but so yes, the need for copy cataloging. Yes, you would you're going to add something to your your catalog. Nobody at CUNY owns it. You would you would still go to OCLC to find a bibliographic record. You'd pull it into the network zone because you're the first one adding it. You would you would add the record and then you would attach your holdings at the institution zone. The next, the next campus comes along and they want to add a copy because they bought the same book. Oh, there's already a record in the network zone. I'll attach my local institution holdings to that network zone record. So it, it makes the copy cataloging simplified because the record's already been added. 
and now you're just adding your holdings information, if, the, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, thank you. Okay, and going back to Jesus's question about fulfillment. Um, so I think Jesus would just like um, maybe an example of fulfillment because he says, just when you say fulfillment, I think meaning an order, but how is it used here more broadly? So I guess, Kathy and Kevin, if you can just talk a little bit more about fulfillment to see. Uh, fulfillment, we, we don't use fulfillment for cataloging purposes. It's uh, like what Kevin said, it's a front end. So you deal with patrons and all the requests going. So it's it essential the circulation access services the terms will uh, will go away in the Alma environment. Um, instead, we use fulfillment um, that actually covers all the access services functions, including circulation, checking things out, checking things in, um, uh, reserve, uh, resource sharing that we are using today in Alif uh, for access services will be covered in uh, the Alma environment. Uh, as fulfillment. Kevin, if you have anything to add, please. Yeah, no, I think that's that's pretty much that does describe it. It's it's a little bit different than it's a little bit different than some people may think of access services. They don't call it purely access services because some people I might be thinking of it a little what you what they think of as access services may be a little narrower band than what is actually covered by fulfillment but again thinking of thinking in terms of front end whatever you're doing to provide materials to a patron that's that's generally what fulfillment is and as you can see from the screenshot i mean we didn't we don't talk about booking but for example i want to put in a reservation because i want to use these materials on thursday from 4 to 8 p.m., I can book materials. Uh, doesn't mean we're gonna necessarily turn that functionality on. Libraries may not want to use that. Uh, they don't use it in Aleph, but it's the, the point is that the functionality is there. Okay, and I have a comment from Marcia Clark in the chat box. It just says, part of the confusion is that fulfillment is used in the sense of an acquisitions order being filled by a vendor. In Alma, the term is used differently. Correct. Okay. So, so there's that. Okay. So another question from Sean O'Hare at City College. Will community zone and network zone be view only for institution or campus based users, or will there be some institution slash campus users who will work on the network zone level? Community zone access is more is more restricted because it is worldwide. So not necessarily every library has access into the community zone for writing and changing things. But uh, you, do you have access to view? Yes, you, you, for community zone, that's, that's definite. The access at the network zone level, that's a great question. And that's exactly why we have a working group that's gonna work on the metadata standards for how, who's gonna access what in the network zone um that's 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 a great question and once the working group gets working on it we'll have a, a great answer for you but at this point it it's something that remains to be seen exactly who will, who will do what okay thank you kevin um i have another question from uh, tina i'm sorry i don't know your name or or affiliation. Um, what if the record is not in OCLC or the community zone? Will we still be able to create a record for our of our own in our local records? Uh, yes. yes. Absolutely. Well, it depends on the the, uh, the item you're trying to create. If you're trying to create a, a, a for a new title, uh, not for your own purposes. For example, uh, if you want to create something like your calculator, your a laptop, you for for that purposes, then you want to do it only in your institution zone. But if you have a new title, just like um, in 
the ALIF environment, you want to create an original record, usually it starts from OCLC, then once you create a record on OCLC, then you bring the record into the local database. That part of the job will continue. Does that answer your question? Um, and question, will holdings still go on OCLC as well? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It becomes even more important or just as important. Right. So for you, resource sharing purposes, cataloging purposes. And the and one of the match points within the system will be the OCLC number. So actually the OCLC number becomes more important to us in the catalog. That's one of the reasons why we're working on this, you know, OCLC reclamation. It, it's really an essential part of the, the preparation for a move to ALMA. Are there any more questions? Um, I have a question from Marguerite Iskandarian at Brooklyn College. Will our authority file be the same as an ALIF? If not, what will happen to authority records created locally in ALIF? Um, the, the locally created authority record will, uh, will be kept. It will be used by uh, the CUNY community. Um, in the, right, so this, um, we will have to have uh, some kind of guidelines for uh, authority uh, control purposes. It will be established by the community, by the CUNY, and then through the cataloging and metadata standards working group. Then we will um, collect all the community thoughts, and then when we will, uh, when we will be establishing this, and then it will get collect all your thoughts how we want to. Um, do our authority control in the ALMA environment. Um, question from Jim Malone. Can the booking feature be used to place a hold on a reserve item for a certain period? Will the working group work on this? Can, can the booking feature be used that way? It could be used that way now, today, in Aleph, in theory. And certainly it's functionality that we could begin to use in Alma. It's, it's, uh, it's a question that we would need to put to the working group when they begin looking at that. Can we, can we go to the LSP guide? on the screen and open the, up the, uh, yes, open up the working group, the views, and that would be access services and resource sharing. And we'll look down, I just wanna see who's on there. So scroll down, so these are the people that would be on that working group. So I would certainly say it would be a good idea to bring to one of the members of the working group your, your thoughts or concerns about booking and then when the group meets, they can absolutely discuss it and, and, and address it. But also I would say that separate from the working group, <clears throat> it is gonna be part of the training that we do. So there's nothing stopping a library from deciding that they want to use booking even if other libraries aren't. And, using it themselves. Um, 
Another question from uh, Liz. Will ProQuest have access to our user information contained in Alma? And if so, how will they use it? And I think as far as I know, I don't think we can look into this. Um, Greg, maybe you have some thoughts on this. Or Kevin? I would say that our user information is that we put into the catalog is limited uh, to begin with. And when you say ProQuest, do you mean ProQuest, the, the vendor company that owns, because ProQuest is a company that owns Ex Libris. So they would own or manage the, the, uh, appli the application for us? Yes. So. Yeah, so we can review their privacy policy. policy. Yep. And I'll just copy and paste that into the chat. anything else one of the questions I would have for the audience uh, we're doing these webinars the the goal is not to use the webinars in place of training we're gonna have training separate from the webinars in theory if somebody never saw any of our OLS webinars they would still attend the training later this year and they would still learn all they need to know do their job. The question I have for, for people who are watching this is, what, what are the kinds of things that people would want us to talk about during these webinars? It could be about Alma specifically, it could be about data migration and preparation. Okay, I got some, I think, ideas for future. Yeah. Um, so some ideas, workflow integration, roles and permissions, and overviews of how Alma actually works would be good. Data migration, statistics examples. All ideas for future webinars. Yeah. When you're thinking about these different ideas or suggestions, it would be helpful to make them more more specific or more focused. Because any one of you know a broadly defined topic we could talk about, but if it doesn't address the thing that you're particularly concerned about, then then that isn't necessarily helpful. But if you did have a specific question, whether it's now or if you think of it in the coming weeks. Absolutely, let us know. Okay. And I also, we have a question from Jim uh, Malone. If a user wants to opt out of being tracked when using OneSearch and or Alma, can they do so? And again, Jim, that's a good question and we're going to have to review the policy. I know because they comply with GD, um, GDPR, GDRP. Um, there is a way to request that at least the data be expunged. And we have our own policies at CUNY um, in the OLS for privacy. They're on the OLS website, cuny.edu slash libraries. Um, One thing I would point out is that users would not have direct, when I say users, I should say patrons, for example, students or campus faculty, they don't 
have access to Alma directly. They have access to Primo. So there is no, there would be no tracking of patron activity, their search activity in Alma because that's not something that they would do. They wouldn't have an account to log on. So they're, they're insulated in, in that sense, in, at least in terms of their search activity. And Greg points out that we'll review the Alma contract for any applicable data sharing with third party questions. And, and as far as resource sharing with libraries outside of CUNY, the thing I would point you to is because we'll still be using Tapasa and Iliad, those, whatever the answer is for Tapasa and Iliad, that would be the same answer for what we're going to do with resource sharing outside of CUNY. Because we're essentially handing, we're handing off the requests to those tools. So that part remains the same. Jim, continuing his question about the users. Um, so patrons right now, when they log into Primo, they do so through a secure connection. There are cookies and things that are set to track certain things um, for their searching. Um, again, we'll review all of the policies specifically in our contract. Um, but Xlibris makes their privacy policy available online. I sent the link through the chat box and I'll also include it. Um, uh, we'll put it also on the implementation guide. So those answers can be, questions can be answered that way. Um, but like Kevin said, there in Alma, there is, there is the patron account and that comes from CUNY first. It's just loaded in the way it has been through Aleph. So once they log in, it's just, they'll be, they log in through Primo. And again, that's through a secure login process and like I said, Xlibris complies with GDRP, so users can, GDPR, sorry, um, users can request that their information be removed if need be. Um, I have another question for Marguerite Descandarian. In Alma Primo, will we still be able to qualify browse searches by format as we now can in Aleph Primo? Can you, Marguerite, um, so you're saying in, when we browse right now in, so, uh, sorry, Marguerite, if you can provide a little more context. So in Primo right now in OneSearch, when you do a browse search, you browse by title, you browse by author, you browse by subject, you browse by call number. There is no browsing by format. I don't know if I'm understanding the question. Kathy, do you have anything? Yes, you can. Um, it's like you can browse by, um, limit your search by book or uh, uh, electronic, uh, resource or by uh, scores, by uh, D, uh, videos. Is that what uh, Margaret w was talking about? I think it will still continue because our Primo function will, will remain unchanged. It will only get enhanced in the future. But behind the scenes, instead of having an Olive database, we will have an Alma database. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and I just want to point out that in Primo slash OneSearch, browse is separate from like an advanced search or a way to limit your results with the filters. Like I said, browse is just a um, first letter sort of index of by title, author, call number, and subject. You will continue to be able to, as Kathy said, to limit results by format or resource type. 
Um, I have another question from Alicia Selly at the Grad Center. Could there be an opportunity as we create new workflows and groups to implement ALMA and beyond to create a privacy working group? These issues seem bigger than this conversation and will last far into our future. That seems reasonable, I think. I don't know if Greg has any thoughts on this, but that's certainly something we can look into. Um, question from Sylvia, I'm assuming Cho from the Grad Center, to pick up on resource sharing. Even though we use Iliad, et cetera, I thought we could get the added option to borrow from other Alma libraries outside of CUNY, et cetera, so workflows could be affected. Could we review whether there could be some training? I know that, that part of that would involve the other Alma institutions or, or, or networks agreeing to, to participate in that with us. And I know with the way that things are structured with SUNY, they're instead gearing towards, instead of using the Alma resource sharing, they initially tried to use that the way the vendor recommended, and they came to the conclusion that it was better to stay for them with the, with the Alma Tapasa model. So, we would, if even if we wanted to do sharing with Alma, other Alma libraries, that wouldn't necessarily work with, for example, the Sunnis. What the other answer? What the answer would be for other Alma libraries uh, remains to be seen. But at this point, I, I think it's it's too early in the game to say for sure what exactly will happen. But Certainly, we lose nothing um, by keeping our Alma and keeping our Iliad and Tapasa flowing. And also, we have a resource sharing working group. Yes. That will be working on these kinds of things. So that's definitely something to bring up with them if that's a... Yes. If that's something you wish to see happen. Um, okay, and just backtracking a little bit to Marguerite's question. She says, I thought Kathy and Allie gave different answers. Um, so, Marguerite, just to, I think, clarify, a browse search is different from a regular search, right? A browse search, you can browse by title, by subject, by call number, by author. Um, and there is no way to limit that by format. Right now, you can limit by format in a regular search. So when you do a search, you can either do a basic search in one search and then use the filters on the results, or you can do an advanced search and put in the query and limit it by resource type publication year, things like that. Um, all of this will remain the way it currently is with our Aleph Primo setup. It'll be the same in Alma Primo. So I think Kathy and I were just coming at it from different sides. Kathy was talking about the fact that you can limit results based on resource type when you do a search. And I was just saying that a browse search is something else and you can a browse as an index. Yes, it's your initial, your initial search is start as a browse search or as a regular search. Yeah, so if you that's, search, that's right. Right. So if let's just go into, we can do, when we go into one search, if we do a search for something, we can use the filters on the right to limit it by research step. So we can do just, let's do reference. Or we can do an advanced search and from there, we can limit it to a resource type. When we do a browse search, we can browse by indexed fields. So if we do a title, we don't get the option to limit by resource type. And so 
this functionality, like I said, will remain the same whether we're in Aleph Primo or Alma Primo. I hope that answers your question, Marguerite. Okay, yes. So yeah, the advanced search. Yes, we will continue to have um, this sort of advanced search, but this exact same actually advanced search field, and it will work the same way. Alma will also have their the records with a resource type and a language and a publication year and so forth. Um, okay, and Greg also linked to the library's privacy policy in the chat, and I'll just open that up now. So if you wanted to review this, you can. And Greg is following up that we'll discuss a privacy working group with the Council of Chief Librarians. Okay, and it's 10.57. So there's just a couple of minutes left. If you have any questions, now's a good time to ask them. Um, we'll also, we are available all of us in OLS to answer any questions you have at any time. Um, you can either, I think the best way to do this is just email service.desk at cuny.edu with your questions. That way more eyes will be on it. Or if you have someone that you feel comfortable working with in OLS, you can ask us directly as well. Um, I think, like I said, if there's nothing else, this session has been recorded. It will be made available next week after I've had a chance to go through and edit things. <laughs> um, yeah. And um, once we're ready to announce the next session, we'll have another session in August. And we hope to see many of you there. Okay. Any final words from my colleagues in OLS? No? Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy uh, the long weekend. As every weekend is long in the summer. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care.